Robert E. Thayer, The Origin of Everyday Moods. Managing Energy, Tension, and Stress. Narrated by Rosalind Tordesillas and Thomas Florio. When you're in a bad mood, what do you do to fix it? Do you head into the kitchen for a sugary snack or a glass of wine? Or maybe you turn on the TV for a much-needed distraction. All of these are examples of self-regulating behavior. In other words, they're ways of staving off bad moods and trying to create better ones. Unfortunately, a lot of the self-regulating behaviors we choose don't actually do a great job of regulating our moods. In fact, they often make us feel worse in the long run. Overall, many of us have a fairly poor understanding of what will really improve our moods. But that's likely because we have a poor understanding of moods in general. We're often merely reacting to feelings we don't understand. So where exactly do moods come from? And what characterizes them? These blinks will provide the answers and will show you concrete ways to actually improve your mood. Blink one of eight. Think about the last time you were in a fantastic mood. How would you describe your bodily sensations and emotions during that period? Perhaps you felt full of energy, alert and boundless. You were relaxed, with no feelings of tension or anxiety. If you're extroverted, you may have described yourself as energetic, peppy, and vigorous. Or, if you're more introverted, you may have used words like confident, sociable, and happy. Your heart rate was probably relatively quick, your respiration elevated, and your metabolism high. The average person might call this a good mood, but the author would instead call it calm energy. Like all moods, it reflects your body's physiological functioning as well as your psychological experience. This state is characterized by high energy and low tension, which means your body has plenty of resources and can use them efficiently. While mentally, you feel focused and at ease. The key message here is, different levels of energy and tension combine to form moods. In 1985, psychologists David Watson and Aki Telegan studied hundreds of moods. In the process, they discovered a surprising fact that most moods are just variations on two dimensions. They called these positive affect and negative affect. The author argues for a slightly different framework. Instead, he considers energy and tension to be the central factors and has defined four different human moods. Each one is differentiated by varying combinations of energy and tension. We've already discussed the most positive mood, called calm energy, with high energy and low tension. Another fairly enjoyable mood is calm tiredness. In this state, your cardiovascular system is operating at low levels. You've got lower energy stores, and you might describe yourself as tired, sleepy, or drowsy. Nonetheless, there's low tension, so you feel relaxed. Perhaps you're listening to music, reading a book, or engaged in a hobby. Then there's the slightly less positive mood called tense energy, which you might feel when working to meet a tight deadline. Your cardiovascular system, respiration, and metabolism are again at elevated levels. But unlike in calm energy, your jaw, shoulders, and neck probably feel tense. You might describe yourself as jittery or anxious. The final mood is one that almost everyone would describe as bad. It's called tense tiredness. This mood occurs when your body's energy stores are very low. You're fatigued, but instead of feeling relaxed, you're tense. 
you're also more prone to negative thoughts about yourself and your problems. Which of these moods are you feeling right now? Depending on what time of day it is, you may have a different answer, which we'll explore in the next blink. Blink 2 of 8 Most people believe that moods are caused by external life events. If you ask your friend why they're in a bad mood, they'll likely say, well, this or that happened, and because of it, my mood shifted. External events and our thoughts about them can, of course, alter our moods. However, that relationship isn't a direct cause and effect. What really matters is our interpretation of the events and problems we experience. And those interpretations can be influenced by many factors, including the weather, the time of day, food, drugs, social interaction, and even PMS. The key message here is, life events are just one of many factors that influence mood. It's common knowledge that people's sleep and energy patterns differ. Some are night owls, while others are early birds. But for most people, energy is low immediately after waking. Then energy continues to rise steadily until it reaches a peak in the mid to late morning. This is the period when you're most likely to experience calm energy. After that, energy steadily declines until it reaches a low point in the late afternoon, around 4 p.m. Energy then rises again, reaching a smaller second peak, and then declines until bedtime. This means that, frequently, bad moods occur at predictable times throughout the day. Most people are particularly vulnerable to depression at around 4 p.m., when energy resources are at their lowest, and at night before bed. So, say you're hit with some bad news sometime in the late afternoon. That news is much more likely to put you in a bad mood than if you'd heard about it in the middle of the morning. Of course, these natural rhythms are just one factor in everyday moods. They're also tied to a long list of physiological and anatomical features. Take, for instance, the chemicals inside our brains, aptly called neurochemicals. One of these is norepinephrine. Both exercise and stressful circumstances trigger the release of this neurochemical, so it's associated with both high-energy and high-tension moods. Neurochemicals like norepinephrine underpin our everyday moods, and deficiencies in them have even been linked to mood disorders like depression. It's not just time of day or your neurochemicals that can influence your mood. Hormones, blood glucose, the nervous system, and countless other body systems all play a role. And for that, we can thank evolution. Blink 3 of 8 Imagine being a cave person, heading back to your abode. You suddenly hear a growl, a yelp, or a rustle in the trees. How do you react? If the source of the danger isn't immediately clear, you probably freeze in place. You evaluate the circumstances, listen carefully, and prepare to react. This is what's called a freeze response, and it comes before the well-known fight-or-flight response. When we freeze, our bodies grow very tense as we prepare for a potential energy expenditure. Our societies and cultures have substantially changed since we roamed the Earth as hunter-gatherers thousands of years ago. But our biological mechanisms are still very much the same. Our bodies and our moods are designed to help us survive the same threats and cycles of life that our ancestors experienced. The key message here is, moods help us effectively respond to threats. Just like our ancestors, we modern humans experience freeze responses. Except now, they're usually triggered when we're working at our desks late in the afternoon rather than in the middle of the jungle. We sit hunched over, our necks and jaws tight, our blood pressure up, and our heart rates faster than necessary. 
our concentration might be poor, our thoughts scattered. At an unconscious level, our minds are scanning our surroundings to determine the source of the mysterious danger. This is a state of tense energy. In it, our bodies are prepared to engage in fight or flight. Our ancestors may have experienced it while completing their daily work requirements in a predatory environment. Under these circumstances, our ancestors would have needed to execute tasks quickly and efficiently. Other moods are also a result of our ancient past. When fleeing from danger, we make use of calm energy, the most optimal mood. This mood predisposes us to continue our activity without hesitation. When we must run from danger, our bodies can't be dominated by fear. We must instead dash to safety. Of course, we can't maintain a rapid pace forever. Our resources will eventually run out and we'll need to rest and recuperate. But we might also be wary of any remaining dangers. In this case, we'll either be calm, tired, or tense, tired. Evolutionarily, it makes sense that energy and tension are central to our moods. But how exactly do the two interact with one another? Blink four of eight. Visualize getting home from work after a long, hard day. You flop down on your bed and suddenly remember that yesterday you left your clean laundry in the basket. You need to put away your clothes, but right now the task seems insurmountable. Ultimately, you decide to put it off until tomorrow. Later on, you might berate yourself for being too lazy to complete the task. But in fact, there's no guilt necessary. That's because your body is constantly assessing its own expendable resources. And when it tells you to put off a task, your body is saying that it doesn't have enough energy. Of course, these self-assessments don't always have to do with physical energy reserves. That's because tension and energy have a complex relationship when it comes to our moods. The key message here is, tension and energy have an inverse relationship. In an experiment, the author divided participants into three groups. All were instructed to complete the same verbal learning task and then make self-ratings of their tension and energy levels. Some of the participants completed the task under high-stress conditions, others in moderate-stress conditions, and the rest in low-stress conditions. The results of this study were fairly surprising. As the participants' stress levels rose from low to high, tension increased as expected. Energy, however, increased to a peak only in the moderate stress condition. In the high stress condition, energy actually decreased. It turns out that as tension increases, energy does too, creating a state of tense energy but only up to a point. After that, energy begins to decline and tense tiredness will take over. In a similar way, tension increases along with energy, but at higher levels of energy, tension decreases, producing calm energy. The inverse relationship between tension and energy is not entirely dependent on physical resources. Let's say you've just remembered you have an important work deadline in an hour. You have no chance of meeting it. As a result, your tension levels rise very high, but your energy levels suddenly feel depleted, even though they haven't actually changed. Merely thinking about psychological conflicts can produce sudden increases in anxiety and decreases in energy. Of course, you're more prone to tense tiredness if your physical resources are already low. If you missed a meal or didn't eat all day, stress-producing circumstances are more likely to result in tense tiredness. Blink 5 of 8 Throughout each day, we constantly seek pleasure and avoid pain. Over time, our minds begin to develop an association between particular activities and feelings. 
This is how we develop habits that shape our behavior. Consider smoking, for instance. Cigarettes are a powerful mood regulator. Before an addicted smoker lights up a cigarette, her feelings will have told her that she must smoke now. Then, after she's done so, her feelings of relaxation will provide another reinforcement. That cigarette was indeed exactly what she needed. Smoking is an unhealthy mood management method. But there are many other behaviors that people turn to in order to self-regulate. The key message here is, active strategies are the best for mood management. Using a series of surveys, the author and a few of his students determined the most common behaviors that people turn to when they want to change bad moods. They then grouped the behaviors into six broad categories. Then, he asked study participants and psychotherapists to rate the strategies from most to least successful. Surprisingly, both the study participants and the psychotherapists were in almost complete agreement. They rated a strategy called active mood management as the best for improving bad moods. This method involves actively trying to change a bad mood by using certain behaviors, including relaxation techniques and cognitive strategies like meditation. Out of all these behaviors, there was one that stood out as the most successful overall. It was rated the absolute best for changing a bad mood. And it was rated close to the best at increasing energy and reducing tension. That behavior was exercise. Later on, we look at exactly why it's so effective. But first, let's look at the second most successful strategy. It's called seeking pleasurable activities or distraction, and it involves engaging in a hobby, listening to music, or changing your location. These behaviors work by forcing your thoughts to turn away from whatever is causing your bad mood. On the other end of the spectrum, direct tension reduction was rated as the least successful strategy. This behavior involves taking drugs, drinking alcohol, or having sex in order to improve moods. Why is this method so ineffective? Well, Something like alcohol might make you feel good at first, but in the long run, it's bad for your health and the after-effects ultimately make you feel worse. Some people are more likely than others to use the direct tension reduction strategy. In the next blink, you'll find out who, as we look at some individual differences in mood management among men and women. Blink 6 of 8 One day, a student was listening to the author's lecture on mood regulation differences between males and females. The author explained that women often seek social interaction as a remedy for bad moods. Men, on the other hand, are more likely to immerse themselves in hobbies. For this student, the author's words struck a chord. Whenever she and her husband got into an argument, The student always wanted to continue talking about the dispute. But her husband would instead head to the garage to work on his car. Thanks to the author's lecture, the student realized that her husband wasn't just a jerk. He simply had a different way of dealing with his moods. Understanding individual and group differences between mood regulation methods can greatly improve interpersonal communication. It can also help us replace bad behaviors with good ones. The key message here is, recognize your unhealthy mood regulation behaviors and then replace them. Studies have uncovered differences in mood regulation methods between various types of people. But the biggest difference of all lies in the ways men and women deal with their moods. Overall, men use the best mood management strategy, active mood management, slightly more than women. Both, however, engage in some less successful behaviors, too. Women, for instance, are much more likely than men to use passive mood management, 
a behavioral pattern that includes activities like watching TV, drinking coffee, and eating. In one illustrative study, women were found to eat nearly twice as much sweet food under stress than under normal conditions. Meanwhile, men actually ate less under stress. Unlike women, though, men are much more likely than women to use the direct tension reduction strategy to improve their moods. In other words, they take drugs, drink alcohol, or have sex. Given that there are four times more male alcoholics than female ones, this pattern makes sense. So what can we take away from these findings? Well, if you're a woman, it might be a good idea to ensure you aren't overeating when stressed. If you're a man, do your best not to indulge in alcohol or cigarettes. Instead, swap these coping mechanisms out for healthier ones. Next time you're stressed and feel a craving for a snack or a smoke, go outside for a short, brisk walk instead. Studies have concluded that this activity can significantly reduce urges for both sweets and cigarettes. Blink 7 of 8 We've learned that tense tiredness is the cause of most bad moods. So when you're feeling down, how can you most effectively battle tense tiredness and achieve a better mood? Well, it's as simple as increasing energy and reducing tension. And for the majority of people, the best way of increasing energy is through exercise. Exercise results in almost immediate improvements to mood and energy levels. Moderate exercise, even just a 5 to 10 minute brisk walk, can have a significant positive effect. Following a 10 minute walk, one study found significant mood effects even 120 minutes after. More conservative estimates suggest that 10 minutes of brisk walking enhances energy for 30 to 90 minutes. The key message here is, use exercise and meditation to overcome tense, tired moods. Moderate exercise is most effective at increasing energy. But longer and more vigorous exercise sessions are better at reducing tension. Exercising for a long time will decrease your energy, but only at first. A few hours later, your tension will have dramatically decreased, and your energy levels will be fully restored. Of course, if you've ever started an exercise program, you know that keeping up a regular regimen isn't exactly easy. So how do you motivate yourself? Try not to think about doing extended exercise before you begin. Instead, tell yourself you're just going to go for a short stroll down the street for five minutes. Once you've started moving, you'll feel your energy increase almost immediately. This will motivate you to keep going. We've tackled low energy. Now, what to do about high tension? In this case, Just 15 minutes of meditation can be very effective. That's because meditation helps control anxiety-producing thoughts. During meditation, the mind's attention is focused on the breath or on thoughts more generally. And the benefits don't stop there. Meditation also usually involves breathing in smooth, regular patterns, which oxygenates your whole body. It can also relax tense muscles, especially if you're doing certain kinds of meditation like Tai Chi or yoga. And finally, a meditation session before a meal can make you less likely to overeat. When trying to regulate your mood, exercise and meditation may or may not work for you. The only way to find out is through careful self-observation, which we'll discuss in the next blink. Blink 8 of 8. Everyday moods often have fairly simple causes. You don't have to be an expert psychologist or a mind reader to anticipate how you'll be feeling and when. As we know, many people turn to sugar snacking in order to boost their energy. Next time you feel the urge to snack, rate the urge as strong, moderate, or weak. 
Additionally, rate your energy and tension levels according to the same scale. Then, do another round of ratings immediately after you've eaten the snack, an hour later, and two hours later. Studies show that sweet snacks do tend to increase our energy immediately after we've eaten them. But an hour or so later, they usually end up making us feel even more tired than we did before. Document your moods and see if this is the case for you as well. Once you understand your own patterns of energy better, it becomes much easier to change your behavior. The key message here is, improve your moods through self-observation and analysis. We've discussed the way everyday moods tend to flow in a typical pattern. To understand the ebb and flow of our moods, it can be helpful to make an energy and tension chart. To do this, choose at least three typical days when you wake up and go to sleep at the same time. On these days, write down your energy and tension levels at the beginning of every hour, on a scale of 1 to 4. Then, after the three days are up, plot out your ratings for each day on a single graph to see your typical energy and tension patterns. During this process, you might have a hard time pinpointing your precise levels of tension. That's why it's helpful to learn some common effects associated with tension. These can be certain behaviors, like tapping your fingers, or physical sensations, like tightness in your neck. They can even be thoughts, like urges for food or other substances. Once you have your energy and tension graph, you can take advantage of your typical moods throughout the day. You can schedule your most stressful activities for high-energy times, for instance. And you can choose to settle interpersonal disputes over the weekend instead of in the evening or night. When you begin to understand and recognize your everyday moods, you'll be far better at controlling how you feel. And ultimately, you'll live a happier life. You've just listened to our blinks to The Origin of Everyday Moods by Robert E. Thayer. The key message in these blinks is that though humans can experience a wide variety of subtly different moods, all of them can be traced back to patterns of tension and energy. Differing levels of tension and energy combine to create four different moods. Calm energy, tense energy, calm tiredness, and tense tiredness. These moods are influenced by a wide variety of factors, including weather, time of day, food, and life events. People choose a wide variety of mood regulation methods, but the best strategies involve active behaviors like exercise and meditation. Now here's some actionable advice. Assess your mood before you make future plans. When we assess problems and make plans, we do so using our current energy levels, not the energy levels we'll have in the future. This is why so many of us enthusiastically make plans in the morning or afternoon when we have high energy, only to regret doing so later. On the flip side, making plans when we have low energy can cause us to be overly pessimistic. So, always be aware of how your current mood might be affecting your assessments of your future plans and problems.